think it's obvious what we're talking about today. Weddings. Somebody famous having something to do with writing or movies or something, I don't know, I'm too lazy to look it up, once said that comedies end in a wedding and tragedies end in a funeral. But what about movies that prominently feature both? That's why we're talking about Bloody Brides, specifically three that provoked a strong reaction in me. Want to know how strong a reaction? Well, I tried to film this essay a year ago in the wrong aspect ratio and couldn't finish for obvious reasons. For the record, this video has been on my list of things that I wanted to do for, for actual months, but yes, I am getting divorced. It's fine. He's right there. He's okay with it. <laughs> he waved. Lots of horror movies are scary to me, but these are extra scary. Because deep down, no matter where we are in the spectrum of a relationship, whether we're happily dating or happily married, we all know relationships are going to end. They are inevitably terminal. Whether you break up or you get divorced or one of you dies or both of you dies, it's going to end. Now I know that sounds fatalistic, but bear with me because we actually have a very happy couple on this list in the form of our third movie. So, you know, it'll get cheerful eventually. I won't be coy. Here's my thesis. Movies with bloody brides help us cope with the fact that all of our relationships are inevitably going to end, aren't I cheerful? Each bride on this list represents some form of elevated relationship threat that all of us will face at some point in time. These movies are sort of like marriage ghost stories around a campfire, or I don't know, maybe canaries in a coal mine. They simultaneously make whatever we're going to face feel a lot easier, while also kind of preparing us for whatever may come our way. Plus, let's be honest, everyone loves a pretty dress in a party. Our movies today are Kill Bill, volumes one and two, but I'm counting that as one, Ready or Not, and the very underrated Wreck 3. Obviously, spoiler alerts for all of them. Beatrix Kiddo becomes the bride during the massacre at Two Pines, which was actually a wedding rehearsal. She was assassinated for leaving her boyfriend, Bill, who just happened to be the head of a squad of super dangerous killers for hire. Hate when that happens. Anyway, she was an assassin too, but decided to leave her life of crime after learning she was pregnant. For the sin of trying to reclaim her own autonomy, Bill and the rest of the assassins show up and kill her friends, her fiance, the piano player at the church, the reverend, and his wife. They thought they killed Beatrix too, but they didn't. She survived, somewhat miraculously, and the implication behind her survival is that she was too strong to kill, and her will to live, specifically her will for revenge, is what kept her alive. In a brief but crucial scene at the beginning of Kill Bill Volume 2, we actually see just how much she truly loved Bill, and the connection is mutual. We see it in their interaction on the porch of the church. There's an undeniable bond, a chemistry. They flirt. She calls him a smart ass. And while she thinks all is well, and Bill's going to let her go gracefully, we the audience know he's literally about to commit a massacre because he doesn't handle rejection well. Again, hate when that happens. I saw Kill Bill alone. Um, I had to. At the time, I was in college and I was involved pretty heavily with a church. With the benefit of hindsight and years and years of true crime documentaries, I can now safely tell you it was a cult and we weren't allowed to see R-rated movies. I didn't care. I was kind of a rebel. I went anyway and the movie blew my mind. But somebody found out and I don't know who snitched, but I got caught. Now, what that meant for me was that I had to be held accountable. And that was sort of like having a staged intervention. My intervention came when I was stuck in a car with several other church people, which is a very good strategy because it meant I couldn't get out of the car. They asked me questions like, how could you enjoy that scene where she was hitting the man in the head with the door over and over again? And I didn't say it out loud, but I wanted to be like, I enjoyed it very much. How did I enjoy it? With popcorn. I like violence. I'm sick in the head. Um, <laughs> that was the beginning of the end for me, though it did take quite a while for me to extract myself. But here's what kind of poked a hole in that for me. A few weeks later, many of the people that were in that car, mostly dudes, I don't know, I'm not, I don't know why, <laughs> 
They actually went to a Rambo movie marathon at one of the pastor's houses, and they all dressed in camo and they carried toy guns, and they didn't have to go to an intervention. For some people, female violence just seems more shocking or more revolting. It's why the Terminator or Rambo are okay, but Kill Bill was like this big cultural no-no. I don't know, it's my only working theory. But for me, Kill Bill was a catharsis. Beatrix Kiddo, the bride, was my Rambo. I think that being a woman is just as violent of an experience as being a man. Motherhood is gory and relationships can be violent. And some of us get mugged sometimes, that happens. And gosh, I know that sounds really dark. Um, I wouldn't want to come across dark. <laughs> The bride is the symbol of survival. She's the traumatized woman's superhero. It's just that the reason for the dangers she encounters differ from the typical reasons for danger in most action films. And speaking purely cinematically, a revenge movie has to start with a protagonist being wronged. That's why we root for them. And this movie set that up very differently than films like The Last House on the Left that felt more like gratuitous exploitation. And I know, I know, revenge isn't right or good but that doesn't mean it's not fun to watch or think about, even if you do get caught and held accountable. Worth it. Honestly, I think Ready or Not is the perfect movie. It follows Grace, a naive young woman who marries into a rich family, not knowing that they got all of their money in a deal with the devil. <laughs> if I had a nickel. The devil gave them a gaming empire. Like, imagine if Milton Bradley was evil. If. As initiation, anyone who marries in must play a game with the whole family on the night of their wedding. The game is chosen seemingly at random from a special box of cards, but it's heavily implied that Satan himself makes the choice. Most of the games are harmless, but if you get their version of hide-and-go-seek, you're in trouble. Because it's basically hide-and-go murder. If they don't kill her before sunrise, they believe the devil will punish them all in some unfathomable way, maybe because he requires a blood sacrifice. We see evidence that this is part of their ongoing lifestyle later in the film in the form of sacrificed goats. This is a weird summary. Anyway, I would posit that he made his choice for a different reason, but we'll get to that later. The secrets to the meaning behind Grace as a bride can be found all over this movie in the form of symbolism. Am I over-reading the movie? Yes. Am I going to do it anyway? Also, yes. For example, the bride descends the stairs to figuratively and literally descend to the family's level, which is definitely lower than hers, morally speaking. Not a symbol, but a plot point, we also learn that Grace is an orphan, which really fulfills the promise of the premise of most gothic horror films, which almost always need to bring in a new or naive character so they can be surprised by the secrets of the big spooky house. The movie also has a lot of reflections. We see the bride looking into a mirror at multiple points, each time taking stock of herself and the changes she's enduring. She starts thinking it's the happiest day of her life, and as events unfold, she becomes increasingly disheveled. Ooh, that's the title of my memoir. <laughs> my favorite shots in the movie are of Grace running back down the aisle, kind of symbolically trying to undo what she did earlier in the day unknowingly. That's the thing about being naive. You don't usually know you've made a mistake until it's way too late. While she can't undo the wedding, she does triumph. She survives, the devil himself gives her a nod of acknowledgement in the end, which feels to me like maybe he wanted to dispatch with the family all along, and he used her to do it. Because, by the way, they don't obviously kill her by sunrise, and they all explode. <laughs> it's great. The takeaway is that trust is scary. It takes a long time to blend into a new family. It's inevitable that you'll find out weird and disturbing things about them, and they'll find out weird and disturbing things about you. And that's family. By the way, the recording thing was on the table for some of this. I don't care. Do you care? Nobody cares. Dotson. We've got Dotson here. You want to know something really funny that happens when you get engaged? People start to tell you urban legends about brides or grooms that die right before the wedding or standing at the altar. I know because it happened to me when I got married 15 years ago. I once saw it happen to a woman, a friend of mine, while she was wedding dress shopping. Honestly, I don't know what possesses people. Except my theory is, 
Weddings and marriages are sort of innately gothic and tied to death. I mean, we do say till death do us part. So I think endings are always on our mind, even or especially during beginnings. What makes the urban legend of the tragic wedding even more tragic is this idea that this young couple who is genuinely in love wouldn't even get the chance to experience any of life together. And I think that's because when you actually get married and you go on and you live your life, you have to deal with problems and each other's foibles. And if a couple dies before their own wedding, they're sort of frozen in time, perfectly in love, untouched by any kind of trauma. In the case of Rec 3, the entire movie is centered around a couple that is genuinely in love, Clara and Coldo. The zombie outbreak happens quickly at the reception in a very funny way. Think drunk uncle. Everyone gets split up and our happy couple spends a large majority of the movie trying to reunite amidst the violence and chaos. At one point, a well-meaning groomsman tries to save Clara by escaping with her, but she won't leave without her groom. She doesn't even know if he's still alive, but she refuses to go and something in her shifts. Her terror turns to resolve. She grabs a chainsaw and runs directly toward a horde of zombies, hoping she'll find him. And this scene is so gleeful and bloody. I honestly don't know why we don't talk about it more often in the horror community. Also, the character of Clara from this scene specifically is like number one on my cosplay dream list. I think we've all felt this moment at some point in our life. It's that moment where the narrative turns or we shift and we suddenly go from being afraid of all the things that could go wrong in a relationship to being determined to be with this person and be in love whatever threats you may face in the future. Ultimately, when the bride and groom do find each other and reunite, by happenstance, the zombies are finally quieted. As the priest of the wedding discovers, he can stop them by reading scripture over the loudspeakers. Turns out they were demons possessing dead bodies. It's a whole thing. And this is what I love about horror so much. The direct one-to-one -one comparisons, the analogies. Because in marriage, there will be demons, probably your own. There will be monsters, probably other people. But if you stick together, if you choose each other above anything or anyone else, you might have a decent chance of survival. Except, even after the bride's determination saved the groom, on the way out, she is still bitten. Refusing to leave her, Koldo picks her up, sort of carries her over a symbolic threshold even though he knows she's basically done for. They kiss one last time, very gone with the wind, and then she bites him in the mouth. She bites his tongue clean off. It's bloody and glorious and amazing. And then he becomes a zombie, and then government agents surround them and shoot them both to death. And that's a successful relationship. They did not part until death, and they never turned on each other. See, I promised you a happy ending. As much as I've tried to fancy this up with meaning and symbolism, the truth is bloody brides are just fun to watch. To see a bride, the symbol of purity and innocence and joy, having to fight for her life and get violent, there's something really satisfying about it. And it feels more realistic to me than the bride at the end of a rom-com. And anyway, all of this funnels down to one fine point. Marriage is scary. Love is not a happy ending. It's just the beginning of your next set of obstacles. It's where the genre of your life changes. We all hope for a rom-com, but we prepare for assassins or the devil or zombies. By the way, I'm engaged. <laughs>